Hello and welcome to the History on Fire YouTube channel. The video you're checking out now is actually audio only. It comes from a History on Fire podcast episode, so it's exactly like the podcast. However, this is not the only kind of thing that I'll be publishing here on YouTube. I'll also have videos that, are, uh, that combine my narration of a historical event with images. So please explore all the offerings on this channel, subscribe to it, and hit like to the videos you enjoy. And thank you so much for your support. Whether you like history or not, if you care about bravery, wisdom, passion, larger-than-life characters, and some of the most emotionally intense moments in human experience, you've come to the right place. Daniele Bolelli is a university history professor, writer, and martial artist, and he shall be your guide in a journey to the place where history and epic collide. A little bit of information for you guys. Originally I planned to tell this story in one episode. Problem was that after recording for a bit I realized I was already about an hour and a half in and barely halfway in our story. So yes I could do an episode that is three or four hours long but I really don't think I have yet earned my Dan Carlin stripes which allow me to record such a lengthy episode without alienating a sizable number of listeners. So what I decided to do instead was to break it up in two parts. You know, normally I release episodes about six weeks apart, but this time I'll release part two of the story within two weeks from now. So if you are the sort of person who likes to listen to the whole story, then you may want to wait two weeks until part two is released, so you can listen to both episodes back to back. On the other hand, if you don't mind breaking up the story until the next time, here is part one for you. Before you start listening to episode 1, I think it's fair to give you a warning. Episode 1 set the stage, but all the, or if not all, most of the powerful moments in this tale will show up in episode 2, in the second half of the story. So if you feel a little frustrated with these episodes, that it doesn't quite pack as big of a punch, just bear with me. This is the necessary preliminary to get to episode 2, where the big knockout punches show up. Think of it as a boxing match, where in the early rounds you have to work the body to get the opponent to drop their guard so that the big knockout punch can happen later in the fight. This is what happens with this story. This first half, I personally enjoy it. I don't think it's a bad tale, but it's not as intense as what you'll get in the second half. So again, please bear with me, decent first half, in order to get a powerful second. So hang on for the next two weeks, and the knockout punch will arrive. Now at the end of the episode, there will be more about how to support the show, and make sure it stays viable for the foreseeable future, uh, plans regarding upcoming episodes, and other information. But for now, without further ado, Let's go set history on fire. At this moment I'm in a cabin in the mountains in Big Bear, California. Snow is all around. I just had a more than sizable portion of polenta, a glorious northern Italian dish, and had uh, equally wonderful red wine. I also listened to some Jimi Hendrix, so I would say all the ritual preparations have been performed and now we're now ready to roll for this episode of History on Fire. Legendary historian Will Durant has described the story that we will be playing with today as one of the great adventures in human history. Author Robin Waterfield 
who has authored an excellent book on this, has written, In terms of gripping adventure, human interest, strong characters, drama and pathos, the story is a survival epic. And if this doesn't get you intrigued enough, a little bit of trivia here, the 1979 cult classic movie The Warriors by Walter Hill is a modern adaptation of the story we'll be playing with today. What we're talking about is the tale of a large Greek mercenary force fighting in a Persian civil war between the years 401 and 399 before Common Era. The story is most famously described in a book written by one of its key protagonists. It's the Anabasis by Xenophon. Because the Greek term Anabasis, which incidentally means the journey up, is not exactly what you can drop in casual conversation at dinner parties, the title of the book has been commonly, albeit freely translated as the Persian Expedition. Before we can even come close to discussing our particular tale, it's important to provide the proper context. So we'll start out with hopefully a not overly lengthy exploration of the history of the Persian Empire up until the point when our story begins. By the time of our story, the Persian Empire was one of the biggest in the world. It stretched from Egypt to Georgia through Pakistan and just about everything in between. There was obviously enormous ethnic difference among all the people who were ruled by the Persian king. But let's see how the genesis of how this mighty empire came into being. The legend has it that Cyrus II became king of the Persians in the year 559 before Common Era. At this time, the Persians were subject to the Medes, who were one of the big power players of the day. But if Cyrus had anything had any say in this, they would not be subject to the Medes for very long. In fact, he managed to unite the Persian tribes and rebel. And very quickly he conquered all of the Median Empire, which included territories like Mesopotamia, Assyria, Armenia, and a whole bunch of other things. And this caught the attention of a neighboring king, King Krasos of Lydia. Lydia is modern day parts of modern day Turkey. Krasos was a bit worried by the very fast growth of the Persian power, and he saw Cyrus as a threat. So after signing a treaty in which they agreed to borders that they would both respect, Krasos was signing the treaty with one hand, but with the other he was already plotting about what to do about Cyrus. So specifically, Krasos decided to address the Delphic Oracle, asking what would happen if he were to attack Cyrus. And the reply in perfect Delphic Oracle style, which is the oracles, in the ancient world, the oracles have this tendency to give you these very ambiguous replies that can be interpreted in multiple ways, so you can never say they were wrong. So in this particular case, Krasos is asking, you know, what happens if I attack Cyrus? Will I win? Will I lose? And the reply is, if you make war on the Persians, you will destroy a great empire. Now, Krasos takes this to mean this is a good thing. I will beat the Persians and destroy their empire. He didn't think that this sentence may have multiple meanings. So in the year 547 before Common Era, he attacked the Persians, but he quickly found out that the empire he was going to destroy was his own. The Persians crushed him and uh, annexed Lydia and the Greek cities on the coast of Asia Minor to their already budding empire. Not satisfied, Cyrus pushed even further, and by the year 539 he conquered Babylon, which was another of the major kingdoms in the area, and this obviously had a huge impact on the history of Jewish people who had been conquered by the Babylonians, where at this time many of them were hostages in Babylon, and this will have a huge impact on their history. And while he was at it, Cyrus also conquered the modern-day Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, a lot of the stans that exist in that part of the world. 
Now, his life had been absolutely epic. He had taken a people who were relatively minor players in the ancient world and turned them into one of the dominant people in the area. And yet, all good things come to an end. So, there are several versions of how he met his death. The most popular one tells us that he died around the year 530 before Common Era, during a war against one of the semi-nomadic Scythian tribes under their queen named Tomiris. Um, this took place around the modern-day Kazakhstan. Dan Carlin has covered his material in his uh, Hardcore History series in his usual masterful fashion in a very recent episode entitled King of Kings. So I will not waste your time by repeating in details the same story. If you haven't checked it out yet, definitely check out uh, the episode of Hardcore History, King of Kings by Dan Carlin. He spent his usual epic, lengthy amount of time covering this material in all the details you could possibly want in his usual great fashion. Suffice to say, for the purpose of our story and moving on with this very quick introduction to the history of the Persian Empire, Suffice to say that this particular group of Scythians were colorful folks. They were pastoralist people who worshipped the sun, they practiced ritual cannibalism, they partook in sweat lodges, they consumed, enthusiastically consumed marijuana, they drank wine out of the skulls of their defeated enemies, were often covered in tattoos were extremely sexually free, with both men and women being able to have multiple partners, and their women were renowned as fierce warriors and riders, many people speculating that the myth of the Amazons was uh, born based on the historical badassery of Scythian women. One of the related nations, the Sarmatian, the Sarmatians had a custom prohibiting girls to marry until they had killed an enemy in battle. Now, these were clearly not the people you wanted to mess with, but apparently Cyrus had begun to buy into his own hype, and he thought he could push them around. He quickly found out he couldn't when their warrior queen Tomiris had his head chopped off and turned into a drinking cup. Taking over for Cyrus was his son, Cambyses II. He inherited and pushed the conquest even further. He invaded Egypt, Cyprus, uh, parts of North Africa. However, one of the things that happens during Cambyses II's reign is uh, a recurring theme in Persian history, which is brothers fighting each other. Because clearly, you know, if you are the king and you have multiple children, particularly if you have multiple sons who could take over for you in this male line of descent, Having more than one is a bit of a tricky proposition, because on one hand it, it's like buying insurance. If you have more than one, even if one dies, you can pretty much assure the fact that there will be somebody else who carries your DNA who is going to take over after you do. But if they all survive until adulthood, now you have a problem, because you have some people who have grown up in the ultimate luxury, and they'll see one of their siblings become king, and they won't. And human nature being what it is, doesn't take a genius to figure out that in many cases, the, the guy who will not make it to be king may decide to rewrite the rules of the game. It's like, why, why is my brother taking over? He's stupid anyway, never liked him anyway. And this will happen time and time again in these stories. It happened during the reign of Cambyses II, his brother rebelled. The rebellion was not successful, but what ended up happening is that Cambyses in the meantime died of a wound. His brother was killed by their cousin Darius, who was loyal to Cambyses. So we have a slight change in the line of descent with Darius, who was still related to Cyrus, but not, um, not in the same way as Cambyses had been. He's going to be the guy who takes over. Now, by this point, the empire is already extremely large. So it was divided up into uh, smaller subsets. Specifically, they refer to some of these semi-independent kingdoms as satrapies. The satrapies were 
pretty much independent as far as local administration went, but they all owed allegiance to the Great King. In exchange, the Great King provided what made the Persian Empire great. Excellent roads, Pony Express with station and fresh horses to carry news and carry even letters over a distance of thousands of miles. The way their economy work was interesting, all the products in the empire would be gathered up by the king, who then redistributed it according to the status of each person. Uh, you would get more if you are a noble, you would get less if you were not. You would get more if you had fathered many kids, less if you hadn't. Some people barely received enough to live. Others, they received so much, much more than they could consume, so they would typically then resell it for money, and in the process becoming even more wealthy. If you are trying to get the attention of the great king, you probably were out of luck, because you had to go through hundreds of petty bureaucrats who stood between a petitioner and the king. And again, human nature being what it is, doesn't, you can already see where this story is going. Many bureaucrats who in turn can open the door who can get you closer to the king, more likely than not, each one demanded money along the way, so bribes were fairly common. Some of the cultural characteristics of the empire were bizarre. Like, to give you an idea about the status of the king, the king's slaves were required to wear masks so that their breath wouldn't bother the king. And to give an idea of how particular the Persian kings became, even on long campaign where we're far from their capital, the king only drank water that came from the river in Susa that was transported into carts for him. So this is quite interesting. And also speaking of cultural stuff, there was this aggressive Zoroastrian idea. Zoroastrianism was the dominant religion in Persia by this point of defeating evil, and this was used by the kings to push imperialism, to push a notion of holy war. Speaking of war, in 513 before Common Era, Darius decided to attack some of the Scythian tribes north of the Black Sea, and so he invaded parts of Thrace, which is modern-day Bulgaria and Bulgarian Greece. And among the people that the Persians gained some degree of control over were the Macedonians, the very same people who will eventually destroy the Persian Empire. However, this is happening long after these events. At this time, the Macedonians have to submit and begin paying tribute to the great king. By the end of the 6th century, in the meantime in Greece, in Athens specifically, some politicians have pushed popular reforms leading to a proto-democracy. Now, the people in Athens, this democratic experiment was getting on the nerves of other Greek city-states, so the people in Athens asked the Persians for help against a possible Spartan invasion, even though asking the Persians for help meant submission, meant that you would have to pay tribute to them and you would be subordinate to them. So it's not a decision that they make lightly. They are not happy about it. So if, after they make this deal, the second they find out that the Spartans are actually not thinking about invading, the Athenians go back on their deal. They go back on their war, decide, they contact the Persians and say, we're just kidding, sorry, change our mind, we don't want to be your subjects. And if this wasn't bad enough, at the same time when this was going on, there was a town on the western coast of modern-day Turkey, a town by the name of Miletus. Miletus rebelled in 499 against Darius, and the Athenians decided to help this rebellious city. Now, King Darius was seriously mad. There's, there's a story told about him that he fired an arrow in the sky while praying to Ahura Mazda, who was the main Zoroastrian god, to allow him revenge against the Athenians. And he took this business seriously enough that he asked one of his attendants to, three times a day, 
to repeat to him, Master, remember the Athenians. That's commitment. You got to you got to give it to the guy that, you know, he wanted to make sure never to slide on his commitment to punish the Athenians for what they had done. He starts the process by crushing the rebelling cities in Asia Minor, crushed several of them along with Miletus, and he grabbed the local population and either killed them all or sold them as slaves just to give everybody else in the empire the message of what would happen if you try to rebel against the great king. In 492, he finally launches an expedition against the Athenians themselves. But the expedition fails because there's a series of shipwrecks as they try to make their way to Greece. Uh, the only people who would be happy with this story will be the sharks in this part of the world who apparently ended up eating a whole bunch of Persians trying to cross over to Greece. So after this uh, field experiment, a couple of years later, the Persian king try again. The invasion begins well, but eventually the Athenian forces will face off against the Persians at Marathon, only about 40 kilometers from Athens, and in a huge upset that hardly anyone had seen coming, the Athenians are able to defeat the Persians in this epic battle of Marathon. The story goes that the battle was so fierce and brutal that the Greeks reported that the battleground was haunted by the ghosts of the dead, both men and horses, for years to come. And this is one of the big what-ifs of human history. What would have happened had the Persian conquer Athens at this time? You know, Athens is such a central element in the story of the development of the West. This is where we see some of the early... Uh, democratic experiments, this is where we'll see the birth of Greek philosophy, this is where we see so much of the stuff that will shape Western culture. Well, what would have happened had the Persians conquered this? Clearly the whole history of the West, and by default the whole history of the world would have changed, at least to some degree. Now, after the second failed experiment, Dario still has the guy whispering in his ear three times a day, Master, remember the Athenians, but he's getting distracted by some rebellions taking place in both Egypt and Babylon. And by the time he's trying to crush these rebellions, in 486 he dies. So the task to punish the Greeks falls on the shoulders of his son, Xerxes I. Xerxes wastes no time and decides to start another attempt at invading Greece. And the army that he sends over is no one to be kidding around. It's there are hundreds of warships, possibly anywhere from the low estimates suggest a hundred and fifty thousand troops, possibly a lot more. And this is where the famous stories of the Battle of the Thermopylae, later the Battle of Salamis, you know, these huge conflicts that are etched in the history of the West. You know, if you have watched the movie 300, well, 300 is not exactly the most historically accurate movie you're ever going to see, but you get the vibe in terms of what uh, the story is about. I won't go into all the details since this has been covered by so many people multiple times. Enough to say that, yet again, the Persian invasion will fail. Uh, Xerxes cannot believe his eyes, particularly in the in the naval battle of Salamis, where he sees his huge fleet getting destroyed by the Greeks. And just to, I guess, encourage the morale of his other commanders, Xerxes executes all, of his, all his naval commanders for their failures and turns back and returns to Persia. By this point, it's becoming clear that conquering Greece is not as easy as the Persians had hoped it would be. Now, the conflict between Persians and Greeks continues for several years without any huge, uh, anybody scoring huge victories. And by 449, before Common Era, the Athenians end up signing a peace treaty with the Persians. I will spare you the details of what happens in the dynastic line of descent in Persian history after this, because it gets really complicated. There's... Um, 
some guy will come into power under the name of Artaxerxes the first and he'll get killed and somebody else will come in to avenge him and he'll get killed. I'll spare you all the details. Long story short, there are a lot of killings going on um, where somebody looks like they are going to come into power. They come into power for a brief period. Somebody else killed them. Somebody else killed the guys who killed them. I won't bother you with all the many, many, many names that characterize this story, since we're just doing a brief overview of this. Uh, long story short, after all this internal killing is done, the guy who comes to power is a man by the name of Darius II. In the meantime, in Greece, all hell is breaking loose. The rivalry between the two main city-states, Athens and Sparta, is coming to a boiling point. And by 431 before Common Era, this huge conflict known as the Peloponnesian War breaks out. It will last for about 30 years. It's going to be a bloody, brutal conflict that will wreck much of Greece. And at this time, the Athenians initially renew a treaty with Persia to try to prevent the Persians from aligning themselves with Sparta. But in what by now is becoming a recurring cycle, the Athenians break the treaty with the Persians and will end up encouraging rebellions against the Persians. So it's not a huge surprise to find out that Persia eventually allied itself with Sparta. Now this quick overview of Persian history is getting to the final rush. We're getting real close to the origin of our story, the one that we'll be playing with today. The Persian king Darius and his wife Parisatis had two sons, one named Artaxerxes and one Cyrus. Now, every good parenting book in the universe will tell you that parents should never, ever play favorites among their kids. But apparently the queen, Parisatis, was not thrilled with taking this advice and openly liked Cyrus better than his brother and was on his side. She uh, helped him get him powerful position in Asia Minor when he was still very young, and she was probably planning for his succession after Darius' death, despite the fact that Artaxerxes was older than Cyrus. Thanks to Parisatis' influence, Darius in the year 407 before Common Era sent his uh, 16-year-old son Cyrus to deal with the intricacies of Spartan Athenian diplomacy. A couple of satraps in this part of the empire, two guys by the name of Tissaphernes and Pharnabazos, you can pretty much forget about Pharnabazos, he's not going to play quite as an important role. Tissaphernes' name, despite being complicated and possibly not the kind of name that you run into every day, you want to remember because he's going to play a big role in the story. In any case, at this time, these two guys were quite unhappy with the fact that Cyrus had been given this uh, huge, important role when he was still so young. They felt that, since geographically speaking, the trouble with the Greeks was taking place right next to their areas of uh, dominion. And instead, Cyrus managed to elbow his way in and gain a lot of power right away. Cyrus, in his diplomatic effort, pushed for support for the Spartan commander Lysander, who incidentally destroyed the Athenian fleet around this time, which caused tremendous starvation in Athens. Now, there are a few signs that Cyrus was um, acting in a way that caused a bit of concern back home. At one point, he executed two close relatives, his father's cousins, actually, because they had appeared before him with their hands exposed from their long sleeves, which was an infringement of protocol because, technically speaking, in the presence of a king, you are supposed to have your hands hidden in your sleeves. Problem was, Cyrus was not the king. So his father Darius summoned him back to Susa, the capital, reminding him, hey boy, you're not the king yet, and you're not even in line to be the king because your older brother is before, so... I'm not sure what game you're playing, but I'm, you may want to tone it down a little bit. The satrap I just mentioned a little bit ago, Tissa Furness, supposedly acted as Cyrus' advisor and went with him. 
And again, as I mentioned, you may want to remember the name Tissaphernes since he's going to feature prominently in our story. He was a noble grandson of the commander of the Immortals. The Immortals were the Imperial Guards and the elite troops of the Persian Empire. Tissaphernes was also a satrap, which, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of a regional governor, of the area of Lydia and Caria, and he was commander-in-chief of the Persian army in that section of the empire. Lydia, however, had been taken away from him and was given to Cyrus, leaving Tissaphernes all in control of Caria, something that did not make him incredibly happy. This is where we get to meet some of the other major characters in our story, at least on the Persian side. Tissaphernes' sister was a lady by the name of Statera. Statera was the wife of Cyrus' brother, Artaxerxes, who was, at Darius' death, was going to become the king. Statera was as scheming and as power-hungry in promoting her husband's interests as Parisatis, the queen, was in promoting Cyrus' interests. So you have these two women, each one backing one of the brothers, Statera backing her husband, Artaxerxes, Parisatis backing her son, Cyrus. And the rivalry between these two women, to me, is one of the most interesting subtopics in the story that we're going to be playing with today. The women could be extremely powerful at court, and the king's mother and wife were the most powerful. I hope many of you have seen what in my esteem is one of the best TV series ever made, HBO's Rome. Unfortunately, it ran only for two seasons, but it was quite amazing. Well, if you have, if you haven't, run to rent it and get it. If, uh, if you have, you may remember this memorable character of Atia. I sort of picture Paris Atis exactly the way Atia plays in HBO's Rome. Politically scheming, major power player behind the scene, absolutely ruthless in her quest for domination. And Statera, pretty much like her, is sort of a mirror image of her in a lot of ways. Statera also belonged to a powerful noble family, but it was a troubled family, to say the least. And Tissaphernes, her brother, and Statera, they were sort of the survivors of a family that had once been powerful, but had met with some serious unhappy moments. Specifically, what had happened was this. A few years earlier, another one of Statera's brothers, a guy, well, I forget the name. Some of these names get ultra complicated. Let's just leave it as another one of Statera's brother. He was a satrap of Hyrcania. He had married a daughter of Darius and Parisatis, and so was also a sister of Cyrus and Artaxerxes. But in the kind of nice turn that would make, would absolutely make the day for guys like Shakespeare or George R. R. Martin or other writers with a similar passion for twisted plots, Statera's brother had fallen in love with one of his own sisters, not Statera, another one that again, I'll spare you the names. And in the process, he had decided to try to kill his own wife and plan a rebellion. As you may imagine, it did not go incredibly well with King Darius and his wife. So they had this guy and many of their relatives executed. The only people they spared out of this family were Tissaphernes and Statera, respectively because Tissaphernes had rendered great service to the empire, and Statera was the wife of the heir to the throne. Some people speculate that the conflict between Parisatis and their son Artaxerxes was all about the fact that Artaxerxes had been adamant about having his wife spared. And whereas uh, his mom was ready to have her head chopped off and be done with it, Artaxerxes was like, come on, man, it's my wife, can kill her. And eventually he got his way. Here we get to a turning point in our story. Darius is dying, and shortly before dying, he tells Cyrus that he should let his elder brother rule. Now, Artaxerxes has, 
as part of the rituals that were supposed to take place so that he would become king, he had to go to this temple, perform all of these uh, ritual activities. So far so good, except that Tissaphernes brought to court a priest telling Artaxerxes, watch out, your brother Cyrus is planning to kill you during the ceremony. Now, this is a bit weird since it seems unlikely that Cyrus would have done uh, his own dirty work by his hand, and it seems even more unlikely that he would have tried to kill Artaxerxes during the ceremony in the temple, which is an act that would have turned public opinion against him. But weird or not, Artaxerxes does get concerned, and his concern amounts even further when his own wife, Statera, supports Tissaphernes' account and warns her husband about Cyrus. So Artaxerxes decided, okay, I'm getting it from too many directions, maybe there's something to this. He decided to arrest Cyrus to put him to death. But their mom steps in and says, whoa, 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 no, you can't have that, you can't kill my other son. She managed to convince Artaxerxes to let Cyrus go, to rule, go back to a distant province in Asia Minor, rule over there, they're away from the courts, no harm done. Now, Artaxerxes concede, but he's not stupid. He knows that he needs to... If Cyrus is truly planning some kind of a rebellion, Artaxerxes needs to take preventive measures. So he drastically cuts the amount of money that Cyrus had access to. He took a lot of the Greek cities off the coast of um, Lydia, modern-day Turkey, away from Cyrus and gave them to Tissaphernes. The reason being is obvious, is that without much money, Cyrus would have no chance to organize a successful rebellion. And considering that there's a long history in the Persian Empire of uh, assassinations among brothers vying for the throne, it's little surprise that the two brothers hated each other at this time. Artaxerxes was actually being nice by eliminating Cyrus as a political rival, but not killing him. More likely than not, this was only due to their mother influence. And Cyrus knows this, so he vows never to be in his brother's power again, and he begins to plot on how to become king himself. Likely Cyrus was thinking that if their mom died, he said would be rolling about a minute later. Uh, the only reason why he was still breathing is because his mom was protecting it. The second his mom died, his brother would decide to be done with it and not have to worry about Cyrus was loyal or not. That's likely what was going on through Cyrus said. But maybe something else was at play. Maybe what's going to drive him to rebellion is just wild ambition and his inability to be the number two in the empire. Who knows, hard to tell. Either way, he decides that rebellion is the life for him, and that's what he's going to do. It's at this point that Cyrus begins to do something that's always a wise idea as one is preparing for war, which is to begin a propaganda campaign to get as many people who are sitting on the fence on one side and against your opponent. In this case, the propaganda campaign is against his brother, the king. Cyrus spreads rumor that his brother is a drunkard, that he's a weakling, whereas Cyrus himself portrays, is portrayed as the paragon of Persian manhood. He's a hunter and a warrior who's able to hold this alcohol, who's uh, the ultimate example of a tough guy. And among other things, one of the rumors about him was that Cyrus tended his own garden, why is that a big deal? For a couple of reasons. For one level, because he showed that he was not this pampered elite boy who wouldn't be above menial work, so it would be something that common people would be able to relate to. And on top of it, there was a symbolism, a political symbolism in uh, Persian culture of the time, that if the royal garden prospered, the empire would also prosper. So the fact that Cyrus can make his own garden amazing and beautiful is not just about his skills as a, you know, how much of a green thumb he has and his skills as a gardener, 
It's about the political symbolism that's associated with it. Maybe as a result of this propaganda campaign, the cities in Ionia, Ionia was uh, in the central coast of modern-day Turkey, began to gravitate towards Cyrus' side. And Cyrus started recruiting mercenaries. Uh, keep in mind that Cyrus at this time was only 22 years old at the start of this campaign. Xenophon will be our main source for this story, paints him as always a great guy, as generous, as brave. And yes, Xenophon will admit uh, Cyrus has been uh, deceiving his brother, but deception in war was considered a good strategy by the Greeks, so no dishonor would follow just because he was deceiving his brother. Now, Cyrus' life was luxurious beyond the dreams of 99.9 .9 of human beings ever. He ruled over a large tract of land, he behaved as basically a king in his own uh, space, and yet he risked it all to become the one king, the king of kings, to challenge his brother. There are two possible explanations for this. One that I hinted at earlier, the fact that Cyrus perhaps was afraid that if his mother died, then his life would be worthless because his brother would have been killed. So in this case, his decision to go against his brother makes perfect sense as a self-defense move. And the other option instead is that he just was driven by mad ambition. Uh, author Robert Waterfield speaks of Cyrus' pathological greed. Uh, the fact that he could not accept being number two in the empire. He had to be the top dog, and so he decided to risk it all for this reason. Obviously, we don't know which one of these two possibilities is the true one. There's really no way to tell. Um, just let's keep our minds open that both, uh, both options are on the table. Now, Cyrus began to ask the Spartans for help by promising them some uh, say-so over the, what was going on with the Greek cities in Asia. In a by Asia, we mean uh, the coast of Turkey at this time. And also he was going to do them a favor because by employing many Greek mercenaries who otherwise would have been unemployed and would have contributed to instability back home, he was probably doing Greece a favor, Greece in general and Sparta in particular. So the Spartans decide to send him some mercenaries and really didn't do anything to stop him, even though officially they were allied to Cyrus' brother, the king. Cyrus played his hand very carefully. He used the mercenaries in several small campaigns in order to avoid giving away the fact that he was gathering them for a rebellion. So he started attacking a few rebellious groups within uh, the empire, making it seem like these military movements he was undertaking were not the beginning of a rebellion against the king, but they were simply the normal things that a satrap would do to maintain order over his homeland. So it's entirely possible that even many of the Greek mercenaries who were hired by Cyrus at this time really had no idea what they were hired for. Uh, they probably didn't know that this was the beginning of a civil war. It seems likely that only the senior Greek commanders knew what this was truly about. So here is where our main story begins. The story of the 10,000, is actually more than 10,000, but it's about 13,000, but for, I guess, simplicity's sake, ancient sources would refer to them as the 10,000. When the 10,000 Greek mercenaries will make their way to Cyrus, and will begin this campaign. Our key primary source for all of this comes from the writings of a Greek soldier named Xenophon, who I've referred to already a few times. There are some other sources, like Ephoros, for example, wrote the story of the 10,000, and the details are a bit different from Xenophon's version, but by far the most complete account of the expedition is, without a doubt, the one by Xenophon. So who was this guy? Xenophon was born in Athens around the year 430 before Common Era. So by the time of this story, he was in his late 20s. He was an aristocrat. He was definitely among the elite. But unlike today, when the elite are usually people who make political decisions, but they send other people to be their pawns and fight their wars, 
Being elite back then, being an aristocrat back then, meant that you were expected to fight in war. You did not send people to fight your wars for you, you had to be in the front lines. Xenophon was born at a terrible time in Greek history. He was born at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, which was the brutal showdown between Athens and Sparta plus their respective allies, which wrecked Greece between the year 431 and 404 before Common Era. Around the time when Xenophon was born, a plague had hit Athens, and it lasted for three years. People speculate that it was probably some form of typhoid fever. But it is the historian, the very famous historian Thucydides, give you a feeling for what the plague was like in Athens at the time when Xenophon was born. Here are Thucydides' own words. People had fewer inhibitions about self-indulgent behavior they had previously repressed, because they saw how rapidly fortunes could change, how those who were well off suddenly died, and how those who had formerly been destitute promptly inherited their property. The upshot was that they sought a life of sweet and pleasurable gain, because they regarded their lives and their properties as equally impermanent. No one had the slightest desire to endure discomfort for the sake of what men deem honorable, because they doubted whether they would live long enough to earn a reputation for honor. In fact, what was held to be honorable and beneficial was whatever contributed to the pleasure of the moment, regardless of its source. Fear of the gods and human laws were equally ineffective as deterrents. The sights of the religious and the irreligious dying equally made people conclude that piety made no difference, and no one expected to live long enough to be taken to court and be punished for his crimes. So as you may imagine, this kind of very dramatic conditions really influenced the mindset of the people who were alive at this time. I mean, the average life expectancy for an Athenian at this point was about 35 years old. That really puts in perspective one's plans for life and their ideas of right and wrong and everything else. It's no surprise that a philosophical current known as Sophism began questioning morality, the traditional morality that had prevailed in Athens prior to this time, and the very existence of the gods. So the combination of the war with the plague and all these other things were it basically triggered a moral and religious crisis at the time when Xenophon was born. In traditional Greek religion held that the gods were all around and they could influence life, and that sacrifice was the way to please them. But the gods seem to have forgotten to answer anybody's prayers during these times. This does not mean that people stop believing in the gods. As we'll see in Xenophon's narrative, there are plenty of times when Greek soldiers will turn to the gods for answers. But it does mean that this was a period of serious crisis. At the end of the Peloponnesian War, the crisis continues. The, the war ended in defeat for Athens. And what happened in Athens at the end of the war was that a new government came into power, known as the 30 Tyrants. They were a pro-Spartan oligarchy that tried to squash democracy in Athens and killed over 5% of the population of the city, during the purges against their political enemies. The 30 didn't last very long. In their turn, they were killed, most of them at least, uh, during a bloody revolution. And what does this mean for Xenophon? Xenophon was really turned off by the brutality of the 30, but he really didn't like democracy either. He was very much out of place in Athens. So when one of his friends invited him into the army, uh, trying to recruit him for the campaign that Cyrus was beginning to wage in Persia. Xenophon jumped on the occasion, deciding that he was probably motivated by adventure and desire for glory, and probably get out of Athens as well. Money was likely not the main factor, since he was quite wealthy to begin with, but the other factors definitely played into it in convincing him to say yes. Now, technically speaking, before agreeing to join the expedition, Xenophon 
ask the opinion of his mentor. And if you are wonder if you are wondering who Xenophon's mentor is, I can pretty much bet that you have heard of him. Because Xenophon's mentor was one of the giants of Western philosophy, Socrates. Socrates told Xenophon to ask the oracle in Delphi. But it's quite obvious that Xenophon had already made up his mind. So rather than going to the oracle and asking whether he should join the expedition or not, Xenophon asked the oracle which of the gods he should pray to and make sacrifices in order to return safely. So when Xenophon told Socrates, Socrates yelled at him, because he basically said, look, you obviously have asked the wrong question. You are, you, you trick the oracle in this way. We're supposed to find out whether you are supposed to go or not, not which gods you are to pray to. But either way, what's done is done. And by the time Xenophon left town, this would be the last time that Xenophon would see Socrates alive. In fact, while he was away during the time frame of our story, during the expedition of the 10,000, Socrates will be put on trial and eventually executed. At some point in the future, I may dedicate an episode to the story of Socrates' trial, so I won't go into the details now, and we'll stick to what, what was going on with Xenophon. And so this is how Xenophon departed from Athens and joined these over 10,000 Greek mercenaries who made their way to the coast of modern-day Turkey to come into the service of Cyrus. In the post-Peloponnesian War context, warfare was no longer a temporary thing. Prior to the Peloponnesian War, often it was. Uh, people would wage war from April through October, that was war season, and then you would go back to take care of whatever normal job you had. By this point, instead, it had become a full-time job. There were more and more professional mercenaries, like the 10,000, who lived and breathed warfare. That was their one and only occupation. The mercenaries were better fighters than their ancestors, because these guys were professionals of warfare, unlike the amateur status that had been common in Greece prior to this time. And the 10,000 were even better because they were trained by Spartan officers who had the reputation for being the strictest and toughest officers in Greece at this time. The real reason why they were mercenaries was largely because of poverty, because this was their way in the ruin that the post-Peloponnesian War scenario had created. The 10,000 had nothing to go back to. Many of them had lost whatever land their family owned or all sorts of disruptions had taken place. So their way to make a living was by becoming mercenary, was by true warfare. It is, to give you an idea of what uh, the world view of mercenaries were, was like, it is a song that was written by a 6th century Cretan named Hybris um, that about what the life of the mercenaries entailed. Here is how the, the song lyrics go. My wealth is a stout spear, a sword, and a fine shield, protector of my body. With them I plow, with them I reap, with them I press sweet wine from the grape. With them in hand I'm called master of slaves, and those who dare, dare not bear spear, sword, and fine shield to protect their bodies, they bend their knees before me in fear and hail me as their master and their great king. It's a bit of a boastful vibe about it, but in some way it reminds me of a great line by Robert E. Howard of Conan the Barbarian fame. Uh, there's a line that's almost seemed taken straight out of this 6th century song um, that I've just quoted. Here is how the Robert E. Howard line goes. I've never planted wheat and never will, so long as there are other harvests to be reaped with the sword. Now check this out. I've never planted wheat, never will, so long as there are other harvests to be reaped with the sword. That's what the Ten Thousands are about. They are, if you are not charitable toward them, they are basically thugs. They are professionals of violence who make a living by 
their ability of killing people. Now, regardless of the moral judgment that people may have about the 10,000, their life was pretty regimented in some ways. Uh, the pay structure was quite fixed. There wasn't too much room for the generals usually earned twice as much as company commanders and four times as much as what an ordinary soldier would get. So even though obviously generals are making a lot more, more or less all of the 10,000 are uh, compared to, you know, minimum wage today to a top CEO, the difference was considerably less within the structure of the 10,000. So Cyrus had asked a Greek commander by the name of Clearchus to raise mercenaries for him. Clearchus was a Spartan, but he had been sentenced to death by other Spartans for his efforts to conquer Byzantium for himself and his willingness to fight other Spartans in order to achieve this goal. So in order to avoid having his head chopped off, he decided to defect to Cyrus, he gets hired by Cyrus. And Clearchus, in Xenophon's description, he comes across as a really tough character. He, I'll quote from Xenophon's here, he could have lived in peace without incurring any reproaches or any harm, but he chose to make war. He could have lived the life of ease, but he preferred a hard life with warfare. He could have had money and security, but he chose to make the money he had less by engaging in war. Indeed, he liked spending money on war, just as one might spend it on love affairs or any other pleasure. All this shows how devoted he was to war. Now, that's clearly a description of an uh, intense character, to say the least. Clearchus was about 50 years old at this time, and he had been in active service for 20 years, during the middle of one of the bloodiest times in Greek history. So it seems fair to say that he very likely had seen his share of atrocities. Um, it seems, you know, the indication that is some of the description that Xenophon provides for him indicates that he may have been suffering from some serious PTSD. And maybe as a result of the PTSD, or maybe in spite of it, he was in love with violence. He was seeking it in every way. And some people theorize that for people who have a lot of PTSD resulting from warfare, the desire to get back into battle, to see battle constantly, is because only in the midst of violence they can forget all the rest of the horror they have seen. Because the intensity of battle is so all-consuming that it prevents your mind from uh, chasing secondary thoughts, memories that haunt you. I don't know whether that theory is accurate or not, but it's definitely a theory on the table to explain why a guy who did not need to live this hard life to make a living through warfare chose to. When the campaign began, Cyrus was on a budget. He did not have that much money. So he paid the Greek mercenaries for four months with promises that he would pay them a lot more in the future. But this was all to be seen because he was running short on cash. At the beginning of the campaign, Cyrus made it look like he wanted to clear out Sidian tribesmen from his district. That was the official justification for marching with the army. So Cyrus, his own army, plus the mercenaries, left the coast of modern-day Turkey. Now, in ancient time, an army of this size was, was formed by more than the total number of fighters. There were at least an equal number and probably many more camp followers. The army was really a city on the move. The camp followers included all sorts of people. They were servants following the Greek mercenaries, some of them to carry their gear, some of them to take them from battle if wounded, uh, plenty of women for sex, either concubines or prostitutes, plenty of teenage boys, for the same reason, since homosexuality was quite prevalent at this time. Not surprisingly, fights would regularly break out among the troops for access to sexual partners, since often there weren't enough for everyone, and jealousies as a result of this would prop up on a regular basis. There were also merchants who would uh, keep a market on the move, 
uh, in order to sell their goods to the soldiers. They were slave traders who followed the army, so that if the army won battles, they could immediately start buying slaves at a discount price. In other words, there were thousands of carts to carry people and gear uh, following the body of the soldiers. And along with these thousands of carts, there were thousands of animals. Some, they were designed to, you know, they were beasts of burden, moving the carts along. Others, there were at least hundreds of animals that were used for sacrifices to the gods, since both the Greeks and the Persians did similar stuff. There were huge clouds of dust that followed the army. I mean, think about tens of thousands of people marching, plus their animals. The whole thing must have been uh, quite a sight to behold. It's safe to say that you would have seen them coming from a long way away. To add a nice scatological detail, just for the sake of grossing you guys out, imagine what it must have been like. Because, you know, we often think of war in more romantic terms and the battles and the bravery and this and that. But imagine an army of tens of thousands of people, plus all their camp followers, plus all the animals. And, okay, so what's the problem, Bolelli? Well, the problem is there are no toilets. So here you have tens of thousands of people, plus their animals, all have to go to the bathroom somewhere, except that there are no bathrooms. So that's right there is a good reason for keeping the army on the move, because making camp in the same place where you had been for a couple of days, let's just say it would not be a particularly pleasant affair. The smell would have been unbearable. Okay, now that I've grossed you out, back to the main story. Tisafernes, the satrap that I mentioned earlier, suspect that something is going on and informed the king about Cyrus' movements. A few days into the march, the Greek mercenaries decided to hold the athletic games during a stop, and by now Cyrus owed them a lot of money. And so they are already beginning to grumble and uh, lose their enthusiasm for the campaign. It's at this point that the wife of the Cilician king, a lady by the name of Epiaxa, arrived to visit Cyrus with lots of money. And she just handed it to Cyrus, and Cyrus promptly was able to pay his troops for a few more weeks. This was not the first time that the wife of the Cilician king, uh, this Epiaxa, had met Cyrus. The rumor was that she and Cyrus were lovers. As Xenophon puts it very matter-of-factly, it, it was also said that she and Cyrus slept together. Among the things that happened, maybe to impress her, maybe to as a show-off move to, for his lover, who knows why, but Cyrus asked his Greek mercenaries to, put, uh, uh, to set up a parade, to basically put the army on display so that uh, Epiaxa, as well as many of the other Persian nobles who were by Cyrus' side, could get a full look at the toughness of the, this Greek army of mercenaries that Cyrus had hired. So the Greek mercenaries get in full battle gear, and they march past the spectators in normal review. But right after this, they decided to play a joke on this guy. So they, they set themselves up in battle lines, and their phalanx slowly advances toward the spectators. And all of a sudden, they yell their war cry, and they take off running straight for Cyrus, Epiaxa, and the whole range of noble Persian spectators who were reviewing this parade. Immediately, the merchants took off running. Epiaxa was decided that this display was a little too convincing, so she ran for her life, thinking that the mercenaries were turning on them. And even some of Cyrus' friends got really scared and ran. Now, since the Greek army, since they were extremely good at drilling, they all stopped right on the dot by the royal throne. And they thought it was a great joke and laughed like crazy while... And Cyrus thought, well, I'm glad you guys are having fun. I seriously hope you guys are as good to scare my enemies as much as you are to scare my own friends. In an effort to make sure that the Greek mercenaries were happy, 
Cyrus decided to allow them to go on a rape and pillage mission in the land of the Lycaonians, where a people who had not been fully annexed by the Persian Empire. So as far as Cyrus cared, they were, they were free game. They, the Greek mercenaries could do what they wanted with them. The army by now was about to enter Cilicia, but Cyrus had enough evidence to convince him that the Cilician king may be trying to stop him at a narrow pass in the Taurus Mountains. Epiaxa, the wife of the king, told Cyrus this much. She essentially told him that her husband was edging his bets. He wanted to, you know, on one end he had sent her to Cyrus, bringing a bunch of money and professing his friendship to Cyrus, so that in case a Cyrus would come out the winner out of the civil war, he would be on his good side. But he also would act as if to block Cyrus in order to stay on the good side of the king in case he won. So Cyrus, as in a trap, decided to send the queen back to her lands along with some Greek mercenaries under a commander named Menon, and they would sneak behind the Cilician king's back so that if he tried to block them, he would find himself caught between the two armies. Now, the main army would continue for the pass, but Menon would go through some small, undefended pass that would have never worked for the whole army with their thousands of carts and gears, but it was totally fine for a lightly equipped force. So Menon escorted the Piaxa, who, sure, she was an ally, but if things turned ugly, she could also become a hostage. And by the time they get behind the Cilician king's back, they realize that what Cyrus was fearing was indeed true, that the king had tried to block them. But once he had seen Menno's men arrive behind him, he quickly changed his mind. On his way back from escorting the queen, Menno had lost about 100 men. Some people say they were killed by some of the Cilicians, some people say that they got lost. Regardless, Menon was quite upset about the death of his friends, so they sacked the city of Tarsus and the royal palace in Cilicia. By the time Cyrus' army arrived, the local population was so scared by what the Greek mercenaries had done that only those assembling food and sex were still in the city. Under the advice of Epiaxa, the king of Cilicia decided to meet with Cyrus and again give him more money and Cyrus reciprocated with some gifts, and at this point Cyrus guaranteed there would be no more plundering within Cilicia. The king acted as if he was a Cyrus' friend, but at the same time he sent a message to the king warning him of Cyrus' moves. And again, in this way he would be okay regardless of who won the civil war that was brewing at this point. This did not quite work for him since Artaxerxes, the king, didn't buy this, and following the war had him replaced. During their stop at Tarsus, many of the Greek mercenaries began suspecting the truth about the mission, that they were really hired for a civil war, and not simply to go after a few tribesmen that Cyrus wanted to bring under his control. This creates problems, because many of them feel betrayed, they feel this is not what they were hired for, Cyrus still at this point does not openly admit marching against the king, and his way of trying to convince the mercenaries to just go along is to promise them more money. And Clearchus, being Cyrus' friend and being the main uh, Greek leader in this situation, decided to, he at first tried to boss the mercenaries around, sort of to silence their objections by saying, uh, you need to follow orders, uh, let's just march on. And But he quickly realized that there was too much opposition to this plan. Quite a few of his own men started throwing rocks at him. So the next day he switched tactics. He showed up in front of them in an assembly, with tears in his eyes, and he gave them this speech saying how deeply he understood their concerns, and that now he was either in a position to break things with Cyrus or with them. I'm going to quote from Xenophon, the words that Xenophon attributes to, to Clearchus. It goes something like this. Since you are unwilling to march with him, him meaning Cyrus, since you are unwilling to march with him, I've got to make my choice. I must either throw you over 
and keep Cyrus' friendship, or else I must break my word to him and go with you. Now, whether I'm acting rightly or not, I do not know. But anyway, I shall choose you, and with you I shall endure what has to be. No one shall ever say that I led Greeks into a foreign country and then threw them over and chose to make friends with the natives. No, since you will not obey me, I will follow you and endure what has to be. This is because it is you I think of as being my country and my friends and my allies. When I am with you, I think I shall have honor, wherever I may be. But apart from you, I don't think I shall be able either to do good to a friend or harm to an enemy. So you can make up your minds that I'm going to go wherever you go. And at the end of the speech, the soldiers all clapped for him, they gave him a big ovation, they, they wanted, they appreciated the idea of their general just kind of uh, making this big show of how much he loved them and cared for them and all of this. The reality is that Clearchus was playing them. What was going on is that he started sending messages to Cyrus how he was going to break with him and they were going to go home, but at the same time he sent some secret messengers. You know, the first set of messengers were sent in public so that everybody would see that he meant what he said and he was about to break with Cyrus. But he also sent secret messengers to Cyrus, reassuring him that this was all for show and that everything was going to be okay. The way he did it was that he had planted some people in the assembly to start voicing doubts about what would happen to them if they angered Cyrus. So here they have their commander saying, do what you want, I'm not going to boss you around, I'm going to follow whatever course of action you want to take. And at the same time, their commander is planting people to steer them in the direction he decides. And so what will happen is that they decide to follow Cyrus, thinking that they did it all on their own, whereas the reality is that Clearchus has been kind of pulling the strings all along. So the army feels that they chose to stay, where the reality is a bit more complicated than that. As a result, Clearchus' prestige gains following this incident. Uh, 2,000 more men choose to be under him rather than other, other commanders. Granted, Clearchus was the main commander, but this was not a strict hierarchy. There were other commanders who controlled their own men, well, quite a few of them defect and they switch to Clearchus following this assembly. So the army marches on. The march was very slow. On average, they moved about 30 kilometers per day. That's about 18 miles every day. And considering the extreme length that existed between uh, Cyrus province and, uh, and the capital where the king was, 18 miles a day wouldn't really get you very far. So these took weeks upon weeks. By this point, there were some of the Greeks were getting tired. Uh, there were a few Greek soldiers who stole some goods and ran away and began deserting. And Cyrus gave a speech to the army that he could easily overtake them, plus some of their families who were within his territory so he could kill them all. But he chose not to since this very same man had rendered good services in the past, so in the name of the past he would let them go. This action increased the Greeks' esteem for him, and this is something that Cyrus will badly need at a turning point now, because during one of the stops on the march, Cyrus finally reveals to them their plan to go after the king, that this is a civil war after all, and that they are going after the great king. Many of the Greeks are again close to mutiny. They are getting mad. Some of them decide, uh, this is a trick, we weren't told this. One of the Greek commanders that I mentioned earlier, Manon, decide to, while some of the other Greeks are debating, should we go on, should we not, Manon and his men cross the river before all others. This was his subtle move to gain a top spot in Cyrus' esteem and kind of bypass Clearchus. And Cyrus does what a good employer does in this case in front of disgruntled workers. He just throws a bunch of money at them and they decide, eh, okay, after all, fine, let's go after the king then. So the plan now was to travel through some really rough lands in order to beat a satrap by the name of Abrocomas, 
who was loyal to the king and noticed what was going on and with his army was trying to join the king before Cyrus could get there. So the army decided to march through the desert and the desert march is brutal. You know, there's really not much food. Most of their animals die of hunger since there's no grass. The, they often got stuck in the mud and the troops were really slow because they had to pull the wagons out every so often. There's a interesting instance in which Cyrus asked his own uh, uh, entourage of noble Persians to help along and help pull the wagons out. And Xenophon was very impressed by what happens because here are some top-notch Persian aristocrats asked to help with a relatively menial job. And what happens in Xenophon's words, then certainly wants to a bit of discipline. Wherever they happen to be standing, they threw off their purple clothes and rushed forward as though it was a race, down a very steep hill too, and wearing those expensive tunics which they have, and embroidered their trousers. Some also had chains around their necks and bracelets on their wrists, but with all these on they leapt straight down into the mud and got the wagons on to dry ground quicker than anyone would have thought possible. So this, for Xenophon, is a sign of Cyrus' leadership. The fact that he could give the word and these super wealthy aristocrats can be immediately be willing to get down and dirty, to do what needs to be done, spoke volumes in uh, Xenophon's mind about Cyrus' power and ability to lead his men and have his word obey at the drop of a dime. And right after this moment, there's another instance in which Cyrus' leadership power emerges. The story goes that a couple of soldiers got into a fight. One was serving under Menon, and the other one was serving under Clearchus. And Clearchus punished Menon's soldier by having him beat up because of his role in this earlier fight. So the next day he got close to Menon's camp, and one of Menon's men threw an axe to him, missed him, but not by much, and many of the other people in Menon's camp started throwing rocks at Clearchus. So Clearchus didn't take this well, he got his own men ready, and he got them in formation and ready to attack Menon's camp. And it's at this point that Cyrus stepped in. Again, I'll quote Xenophon, at this point, Cyrus also came up and found out what was happening. He immediately seized the hold of his javelins and rode into the middle of the Greeks, with those of his bodyguard who were at hand, and spoke as follows. Clearchus and Proxenos, and all you other Greeks here, you do not know what you are doing. If you start fighting amongst yourself, you can be sure that I shall be finished off on the spot and you not long afterwards. If things between us go wrong, all these natives, whom you see, will become more dangerous enemies to us than those on the king's sides are. Clearchus came to himself after hearing this. Both sides relaxed and piled arms in their positions. So yet again, Cyrus' intervention proves critical at this moment. At this juncture is the first moment where there's a, not yet a contact between the king's forces and Cyrus' troops, but something close to it. They see the tracks left by about 2,000 of the king's cavalrymen, who had burned all the supplies and the grass on Cyrus' route, very much sort of like stereotypical Russians in winter when anybody invades them. Orontas who was a Persian noble, who was uh, supposedly on Cyrus' side, but he was really planning to betray. And he went up to Cyrus saying, give me 1,000 cavalrymen, so I will give chase and beat the king's cavalry. Those who had done this, those who had burned the supplies along our way, I will catch up to them and I will beat them. At the same time, Orontas had written a letter to the king, saying that he would bring as much cavalry as possible to his side, he would trick Cyrus into giving him some men, 
and lead them to the king. He gave the letter to a man he trusted deeply, but clearly his trust was misplaced because the man turned around and handed this letter to Cyrus, who, needless to say, was not particularly thrilled with Torontas at this point. So he had him arrested, and Cyrus invited seven of the most renowned noble Persians, along with Clearchus, to sit down and decide what to do with Torontas. So Cyrus faced Dorontas and essentially told him, look, you came to my side, this is our past history together, did I ever do something to deserve this betrayal? And Dorontas said, no, you didn't. So Cyrus asked him, is it still possible for you to become an enemy of my brother and a true friend of mine? And Dorontas replied, very honestly in this case, he said, even if I were to do so, you, Cyrus, could no longer believe in it. I mean, he's acknowledging, look, I already betrayed you, so me telling you I'm not going to betray you from now on, how can you trust my word? You obviously can't trust my word anymore. Everybody agreed with this assessment, and they all decided to get rid of him. So on Cyrus' command, Orontas was taken away and never seen again. One element in the story that I find fascinating so far is how devious most of the characters involved, how devious they were, how they constantly said one thing and were doing another. You know, we see Cyrus taking his own troops into going against uh, the king. We see Clearchus taking his own troops in doing what he wanted. We saw... Uh, some of the guys ready to betray Cyrus, saying something to Cyrus, whereas doing something else behind their back. We saw the story of the Cilician king pretending to be Cyrus' friends while at the same time being the king's friend. Most of the characters in the story so far seem to have emerged from one of Robert Greene's bestsellers, books like The 48 Laws of Power, The 33 Strategies of War, Books which, by the way, if you haven't read, I strongly recommend. They are excellent. And they seem to offer perfect examples of the kind of power games that Robert Greene describes in those books. In any case, here is a story where the power games come to an end, or at least the power games behind the scenes, the sneaky power game, the devious power games, come to an end. And the battle for power will be decided in a more straightforward, old-fashioned way, through an actual battle, through troops facing off against each other and see who's going to come up on top. What I'm talking about is the battle that will decide the war, the Battle of Kunaxa. On September 3rd, in the year 401 before Common Era, the King's army and Cyrus' army finally reach each other and they'll face off under a very hot sun by the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. Xenophon tells us that there were 13,000 Greek mercenaries plus 100,000 Persians with Cyrus. And he argued that the king had under his command over 1.2 million men. Now, we are 110% certain that these estimates are inflated. It would have been pretty much impossible to move an army of this side in the condition of the times. Some of the most modern estimates suggest that the king Artaxerxes had with him about 45,000 men, and among those 45,000 there were the 10,000 immortals the, who guarded the royal palace, and were the royal bodyguards and had special privileges, whereas Cyrus had probably about 30,000 men, including the 13,000 Greeks. The advantage that Cyrus had was that he had more Greeks on his side than Artaxerxes did, and the Greek soldiers were considered the prime troops of the day. Many of them were veterans of the Peloponnesian War. The typical style of Greek fighting of this time was a lot of his was troops clashing into each other with walls of shields colliding and the front troops pushing into each other with the shields. 
The front lines often they were fighting so close to each other that they could literally smell each other's breaths. One of the unpleasant side effects of this close contact fighting was that even a superficial wound, which was very common in this kind of close contact fighting, could become deadly, since medicine was not exactly very advanced and the odds of dying because of infection or blood loss were quite high. Since fighting in the front lines was obviously such a scary business, typically the best fighters were placed in the front ranks, and also some of the best fighters were also placed in the last ranks as well to prevent the weak ones in the middle from running. The commander was typically located in the far right corner of the front rank, and the basic tactical unit within the army was made of about a hundred men. The Greeks were not big fans of projectile weapons. Throwing javelins or using slings or bows, which allow you to stay far away from the enemy and made a killing from afar, was seen as cowardly. They saw that a real man faces off against his opponent nose to nose. That's what a real man does. Somebody who snipes away from afar was a coward in their, in their consideration. The upper classes were expected to fight in the front ranks, the lower classes were allowed to use projectiles because they were seen like, okay, you guys can... So it's kind of weird how this uh, upper class, lower class thing plays out because typically in the modern world we always think of upper classes being able to get away with more things. And the reality of the Greek world was that, yes, the upper classes enjoyed tremendous privileges, but they paid dearly for them. They had to take more chances in order to earn those privileges. So in this case, from a survival standpoint, clearly makes a lot more sense to stay afar from your enemy and use projectile weapons. And this was what was uh, the lower classes could do. Whereas the upper classes were expected to show bravery and fight in the most dangerous place of the battlefield. The Greek hoplites, their heavy infantry, they had helmet, shield, spear and sword. The shield was on the left side of their body and was used to cover half of their own body plus half of the men to their right. Panic was serious business going into battle, because again, these battles were not an affair for the faint of heart. They, so Greek soldiers would sing a battle song in order to distract themselves from the panic of running into the enemy line, and they would also sing in an effort to scare the opponents, kind of give themselves courage and scare the opponents. Quite a few people also drank considerable amount of wine before battle to gain uh, liquid courage and keep panic at bay. Panic, incidentally, uh, here is a Greek reference for you. The term panic, the origin of it, comes from the Greek god Pan, who was supposed to spread panic among people. Keeping in line with this idea that the upper classes were supposed to show bravery, Cyrus wanted to join the fight in the front lines. The Greek commander Clearchus had warned him not to, but Cyrus had disregarded his advice. He said, Here I am reaching for a kingdom. Would you have me prove myself a coward, unworthy of kingship? And Cyrus basically tells him, Look, I need to be in the ranks myself in order to command respect. If I don't, nobody will follow me anymore, because they will consider me a coward. Cyrus reassured this man that the sacrifices that had been performed before battle had been good, that the gods were pleased, and the response, the omens that they had sent, were good, so he basically promised his troops victory. Similarly, the priests in the king's service, also promised victory to the king. They said that clearly the gods were on their side. The battle lines were their own. The Greeks were going to be on the right wing, close to the river. Cyrus was going to be in the center. And uh, Cyrus' uncle, who was his second in command, Ariaeus, was to be on the left. Cyrus at some point changes his mind and tells Clearchus to move a little closer to the center since that's where the king was going to be with the 6,000 cavalrymen who represented the greatest threat out of the whole army. But Clearchus refused, afraid that Persian troops would be able to uh, outflank him on his right side if he wasn't protected enough. 
So without further ado, the Greeks sang the hymn to Apollo that they typically sang before battle and moved forward. The king's army similarly moved forward, not singing anything, not shouting, actually in complete and total silence, which must be quite eerie to see thousands of men armed, ready to kill you, marching your way without saying a word. The Greeks decided to up their bravado, so they clashed their spears and their shields together to scare the enemy horses, and eventually they broke into a running attack, all screaming, banging shields, running. The Persian left wing, under Tissa Furness, decided that this spectacle was not for them. They freaked out and caved in before contact, or even before being within arrow range from the Greeks. And the Greeks drove back their enemies, only losing a single man during this battle. Tissaphernes, with some of the light cavalry, started attacking the Greeks by the river. And the problem is that some people suggest that maybe Tissaphernes' men were not the cowards that they seemed to be. Maybe this was part of a strategy. Because they had drawn the Greek army so much forward that they had exposed Cyrus' right flank and the rest of the king's army attacked there. So Cyrus moved in to block the king's maneuver to outflank the Greeks, and uh, he decided to attack toward the royal standard, try to break through the lines and reach the king. The problem is that his men become scattered and lose the line of attack, so that Cyrus and too few of his men are in the, in the avant-garde, forward, ahead of everybody. Some sources suggest that Cyrus killed the commander of Artaxerxes bodyguard by his own hand, and managed to wound Artaxerxes himself, and Artaxerxes ran off. Cyrus, however, was also wounded. As he was attacking the king, someone hit him under the eye with a javelin. So Cyrus got essentially impaled with a javelin through his eye, and is killed, along with eight of the aristocrats who had followed him in this attack, who all died piling up on top of his body. And if this wasn't enough, Cyrus' main servant killed himself right there by Cyrus' body, emphasizing how deep was the bond between Cyrus' servant and himself. Cyrus' death was the end of everything. It doesn't matter how well the Greeks had fought, doesn't matter how... The Greeks actually even thought that they were winning the battle. But the fact that their commander, the commander of the entire army, Cyrus, was dead, clearly changed the dynamics of the whole thing. King Artaxerxes returned to the battlefield, found out that his brother was indeed dead, and ordered to have his head and right hand cut off and impaled on a stake. That's a brotherly love for you. After Cyrus' death, the king's troops attack the Greek camp. All the Greeks were off trying to chase Tissaphernes and his men, so the Greek camps were undefended, and the Persian troops attacked it. The Greek camp followers stood and fought quite well. Xenophon tells the story that many of the Greeks' mistresses picked up arms and fought. So everybody, you know, merchants, prostitutes, concubines, slaves, they pick up weapons and fight off the Persian army's advance. And as it turns out, they fight off quite well to the point of making sure that the Persian army changes his mind and decides that it may not be worthy to try to cover the Greek camp. In the process, the Greek camp followers save a whole lot of people Many Persian camp followers were taken refuge among them, including one of Cyrus' concubines, who had uh, arrived naked in the wards of Xenophon from her ordeal at the end of the enemy soldiers who had captured her. In other words, when Cyrus' own camp was captured, probably some of his concubines were raped by Persian soldiers. One of them was able to escape half-naked to the Greek lines who protected her. The other one of Cyrus' Greek concubines was captured and brought to Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes was a strange character. Once he had in his hands this Greek concubine of Cyrus, he had her cross-dressed 
in his favorite Unix clothes. His favorite Unix, as it turns out, had died, and apparently Artaxerxes was missing him quite a bit, so he decided to have Cyrus' mistress dressed as Artaxerxes' favorite eunuch. Now, the eunuchs at this time were quite common. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, often what would happen during in this part of the world at this time was that good-looking boys were sold to be turned into eunuchs, which is to be castrated and to be used for a whole variety from guardians of harems to, you know, there were all sorts of reasons to have uh, why having eunuchs slaves was considered desirable. The Greek historian Herodotus tells an awesome, disturbing story of a slave dealer who had castrated boys and regularly sold them to the Persians. And that one of these boys that he had uh, sold when the boy was young eventually grew up to become a powerful eunuch and was able to use his power to capture the man who had castrated him in his youth and force him to personally castrate all four of his own sons. Now, if this is not a story that's straight out of Game of Thrones, I don't know what is. In any case, back to our main story. The Greek soldiers thought they had the battle won, until they returned to camp and found out that Cyrus was dead, most of their food was gone, and Cyrus' army had disbanded. The Greek mercenaries were now utterly alone, 3,000 kilometers, which is about 2,000 miles from home. If they were going to ever see Greece again, they would have to cross almost the entire land of a powerful empire full of people who hated them. Originally I planned to do one episode, uh, to cover the whole story of the Persian expedition in one episode, but we're already about an hour and a half in, and we are barely halfway through the story. So we're gonna leave the Greek soldiers in dire straits for now, until we pick up our tale again about two weeks from now for the second and last part of the Tale of the Ten Thousand. In some way, what you have heard so far has been a warm-up, since the most intense moments in the story are still to come. (laughs) 